This is In Boot Camp, Episode 13, So Sequel, on Saturday, April 13th, 2019, with your hosts Matthew Petchel and Ryan Rapperzad. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash ib13. Hey, how's it going? Fantastic. How are you doing today, Ryan? I'm doing very well. Do you know what episode this is? This is Episode 13 of In Boot Camp. That's right. That means we are finally... One episode after halfway. We sure are. And we are. can put that, we, we can finally put this joke behind us. Da, 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 da. At least one more week of this. One more week of this? Okay. And then in, and then on episode 24, we can bring it back. Uh, sure. For being whole way. Whole way. Whole way done with it. Very good. So uh, I've heard that in your boot camp, uh, there has been a lot of sequel going on. Yes. Yeah, so much sequel that you could like hate it or love it. Um, sequel has not been very popular among the classmates. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, sequel is such a different paradigm from just, you know, HTML or CSS or even JavaScript. It is not a traditional programming language by any stretch. It's quite different. Well, some of them got burned this week. So we were given a, f- a file called schema.sql and we were supposed to start it and then we're supposed to import um, this C- uh, CVS file of like 5,000 songs in there. And like line one was like create top songs database or no line one was like drop if table exists and then then the next line underneath was create table and so do you know what happens when you hit that lightning bolt up on MySQL workbench when you have that you just destroyed your entire table up importing five thousand lines you know it takes like two minutes every time you hit the lightning bolt and you just drop your table again it gets kind of annoying see what I did was I deleted it. Because I didn't, I didn't want to do that twice. And plus, from earlier SQL work, I realized that that is a bad convention. But, you know, they give us the files to work with, and we just keep on going with that. Last Saturday, when we started the SQL stuff, we just... I mean, we, we, I mean, our tables were like seven lines, and it was stuff we inserted, and we didn't do anything with. Um, I mean, we were nine columns, 5,000 lines. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big... I mean, this is the biggest thing we've worked with. We actually are working with real data. Um, and this kind of makes it seem a little more practical. Because uh, you can all sometimes when you're just doing exercises and stuff, it's like, oh, what we, it's pointless. There's no point to any of this and stuff. But then it kind of, uh, the more real world it feels to me, the more I have fun with it. That's very good. So what was the data that you received? Um. So... It was top songs worldwide. And so, like, it would have, like, the statistics for the U.S., the U.K., um, Russia, and just all these places and stuff. And I guess some songs, it's funny how s- weird songs you wouldn't expect have a big crossover across the seas. 5,000 top songs, and then we had another file, like, 3,000 top artists. And okay. Stuff. And so then you were probably practicing doing complex selects and joins and things. Tell me more about that. You know, selecting from one table and making another one. So then we'd have three ones and we were talking about uh, having primary keys. So one of the, the one of the exercises was trying to illustrate that, yes, our primary key is row number right now. But is that practical? No, I mean, if you if you wanted to find artist name and stuff, it took bloody for ever for it to come back with a result and stuff. But uh, the more key, primary keys you have or if you wanted to make every single person's last name a key, it would just be really bad with the memory and stuff. So there's so many trade-offs of being faster or slower. For sure. So there, there's a whole art to uh, SQL and databases. So there's there's a role you might know of. It's a database administrator or DBA. And their job is usually to do optimizations for the database itself. There are certain parameters you can tune to make certain things faster, but they are also are very well versed in SQL queries and they can help you tune your tables uh, with indexes and unique columns and constraints. Uh, and you can also tune queries so that they perform better. So, you know, asking for a artist name to be searchable, totally reasonable, sounds like something you might do a lot. Uh, but the struggle is artist name might not be unique. So what if we return two rows? There could be multiple rows that are lined in a thing. Like, what if your application expected to get a unique artist, though? But oh. artist artist names aren't unique. Yeah. When you do that kind of thing, bad things can happen. And so 
a DBA can help you solve some of those issues and help you plan for them and account for them sort of ahead of time. Um, and so then you also mentioned sort of the performance problems by searching every single artist name line by line, basically. That's literally what a database is. It's a big for loop. That's not true, but you can think of it that way. Yeah. Uh, so there's a solution. You can add indexes to your columns that will help speed some things up. So it's sort of like making a map for all of the locations that you visit frequently. Well, the problem with the map, though, is that it has to point to unique locations. Artist name is a tough one to do. So my my laptop has this internal fan on it, like you know all laptops have, and it's really loud when it's spinning that top thing, and it was pretty much three hours of listening to that fan. So, so a database of 5,000 records made your computer melt? Yes. Yes, it did. That's... Just, just importing it into um, Workbench did that, too. That that seems very odd to me. I mean, I feel like 5,000 rows is not, not that much. We just had a lot of fun with that. We didn't actually do too much with SQL. Uh, we already moved back to you know, Node as a server. Because um, so far, we've done stuff with Node and Node modules and stuff. But they are always uh, like just running on our machine and stuff. We were never trying to host or listen on ports or anything like that until today. Well, and before, what you had been doing was little scripts that just run and execute or even little terminal command line apps. So it's good that you started moving forward. Now, I would say that even though you haven't done SQL a lot today, I think you'll be doing more SQL in the future when you start needing to actually have a database in an application in Node. Yeah, Tuesday we start Express, and I'm guessing we're going to have to go back to SQL 2 for a little more of that. I would say by Thursday... You're, you'll probably get some homework that needs to connect to SQL from Express. Yeah. You know, make something useful, in quotes. From weeks ago, you're telling me how you're critical or about how our coursework was laid out. I love the idea of you guys learning command line utilities, like how to write a command line app with Node. I think that's amazing. Uh, I had never seen that before. I think that's great. But it's weird to me to learn uh, about databases before you learn about APIs, because the natural progression of even writing an API in day-to-day -day work is that you make that first, almost certainly. But maybe there was a method to the madness in the long run. Maybe, or they just wanted to do it this way yeah. for fun. So tell me about how you went about uh, performing with little node port serving like tell me the process so um just like the file system thing you don't have to import or npm install or anything else um you can just there is a http module that's built into node and stuff and then you can uh basically create make it listen to server or onto a port and there's a method that's just uh create server and then you just go over to your little browser and type in localhost whatever port you're working on and there's all your stuff and so what what how how do you serve something to the browser? Like what is that? Is it just do you just return or do you have to call a method? You can return uh so with the file system, you can return uh whatever like your index.html, you can return the whole file or you can generate little pages on demand and stuff. Like so like my 404 page, I don't actually have a 404 page set up yet, so I just it literally just creates it and then the browser interprets it. When you do that kind of thing, like, how are you storing your server-side routes? Like, you don't have Express yet, so no. you must be doing something. Yeah, um, switch statements for each switch possible. Statements. Yeah. So let's say I had, like, a index of favorite things, because that was one of the things. Like, your favorite movies, your favorite foods, your favorite things to do. Um, I would have to manually make a case in a switch statement to serve that directory. And so why is it... So so why do you think it's important to use a switch statement there versus just trusting the user's input uh, based on what the, whatever they request? What if they requested something they're not supposed to have access to or something like that? Like this, yes, you have like to know all of root, for example. Exactly. You have to do it this way for protection. Like, I don't know if I should give them a 404 page or an unauthorized page or stuff. So if, when you make this huge, nasty nest of switch statements and cases and stuff, you can guarantee that they get what they need to get. Right, exactly. And it's the switch The switch method is not a problem, really. It's, it's actually just quite, uh, it's verbose, but it's just totally fine. You showed me some source code, and it looks like you've just been returning simple strings and simple HTML pages. So you haven't really done any APIs yet. 
Uh, you'll probably get to that once you start working with Express. Yeah, which is just around the corner. Just around the corner. Hopefully spring is also just around the corner again. Yeah, after this week, we need it back. So do you do you have any insights on uh, what your next homework could be or what your next group project could be? We did get our requirements for the next group project. We start in two and a half weeks. But it's very, very boring and stuff. It's almost identical to group one's project requirements, except for it says you have to use SQL this time and you have to connect to it. Basically, it's identical to group project one. Just go out, make something cool. And so we're going to have the exact same problems, I'm guessing, with we have to come up with something that everyone in the group is on board with. And it depends on how enthusiastic these people are. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder if group work at this point is even worth having in a boot camp experience. I, I would say that it is, but I it also is a it, it is a really big drag when some of your group members don't participate. But so I've been thinking about that a lot since well because I I work with like even after the group work stopped, I mean we're they still sit at my table, I still interact with these people and stuff. One of the guys was just put in a really hard position because we all like okay we need this needs to get done and then like we assigned it to other people and stuff and we kind of left him out of the assigning and then we gave him like weird odd jobs and stuff there's just there wasn't enough work to go around and i don't well and your team did get merged yeah um in this he got thrown onto a project he didn't even get a vote on well one person just didn't care and just wouldn't even open up the thing but while the project was going on and while i was in full we need to get this done mode. I was kind of extra bitter, I guess. And I've mellowed looking back. Well, that's good. I'm glad uh, reflection has found its way to your uh, vocabulary. Now that, I mean, you've done in the real world so many of these projects and stuff, and you just, you have to get something done. Things are going terrible. You really feel like you have dead weight on your team. And then after it's done, you've submitted it, handed it off to the next team to finish the, the life cycle. It's just... Do you ever think like, wow, this wasn't as bad as I was thinking? Like, like you know, sometimes you think something's terrible and everything is just awful, awful, awful. And then you realize it's not actually that bad. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do. I have thought that, but I think it's also relative to, to, to the situation. So there are times when you're working in the industry or just even just for fun working with others. Like, yeah, you know, I, I am pretty sure somebody at three years of skill Pretty much anybody else could have totally gotten this. I I don't know what you're doing here. On the other hand, there have been situations like, wow, this 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 guy has really put in a huge amount of effort. I cannot believe we are so lucky. And you just those situations just come and go. So it's whether you look at that look at it after the fact in the same light as you looked at it in real time. You I mean it can happen, but sometimes you you just gain a sense of, yeah, this is how it is. Right as this class was starting, I got a new laptop. You know. It was pretty nice, and I am have a bag I take to school with me all the time, and because I have a Windows machine, the battery life seems to go away almost instantly, and so I got a second charger on Amazon for $17.80 some cents, and for a laptop charger, that's not a whole lot of money. No, it's um, a great price. So my desktop, or my laptop was full off, plugged it in, sitting down, turned it on, and I don't even get to the post screen. I just get this error in the UFEI BIOS saying that you, we cannot negotiate what voltage your power supply is outputting at. Disconnect. And yeah, so I disconnected it, booted it up just fine, plugged it back in, and it said, we acknowledge that you have it plugged into a power source, but we're not going to charge it, your battery. Plugged in, but not charging. Please insert a power brick that goes over 65 watts. And I'm like, huh. What changed between now and January? And the answer is I couldn't figure it out. Uh, corrosion, internal corrosion. I don't know. It just, I, I couldn't figure it out. I don't know what's going on with it. And sometimes you just get what you pay for. Because a Dell brick was like 40 bucks. It was twice the, twice the money. Yeah, but it also might have lasted longer. So you never know. Battery life never really went below 90 because it was plugged in the whole time. It's not complete garbage. I'm still going to with go. With, it's still going to be my in-bag power supply. 
Yeah. But it seems that at home is the only way I can charge my battery now. Yeah, it, that's kind of a bummer. I actually have purchased multiple chargers for my MacBook Pro for work. Um, so, I, of course, I was given one from, from work. I bought my own personal one so that when I'm at home, I don't ha- I can just leave the one for work at work. And when I'm at home, I can just keep my own and just use it at home. But I recently picked up for traveling this product called the Net- Neck Tech 90 watt Type C wall charger. Uh, it was 36 bucks on Amazon. We'll see how good it is. 49 customer reviews is not that many. No, but uh, I was. It was recommend, recommended to me by the wire cutter, which is everything everybody should always trust. Yeah, so we'll see. I I, I hope you get your uh, battery issue solved. Yeah, it's just there's always something funny going on, and uh, that's what it was this week. Well, and you do have a uh, what a few hour long class, so you do need some battery power to get through it. Yeah, Saturdays is a four hour long class. Plus, I get there early and stuff. It got to be connected. Exactly. And, you know, uh, all those uh, MySQL inserts take a lot of power. Or uh, maybe there's just so much dust or something blocking the fans that the fan just needs to be on. I don't know. All I know is uh, it turns heads sometimes. There's one person with a gaming laptop that really makes some noise, but I have one of the louder laptops in the room. It's a Windows laptop. What did you expect? Nobody complains about the person with the MacBook next to me. Uh, Imagine that. Well, where can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me at MatthewFetcher.com. You can also find me under the People's tab on the Nexus.tv. That is excellent. And, of course, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Amar and, of course, on my website, RyanRapperset.com. You can also leave us comments and chat with us on Reddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And, of course, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. And uh, it was a great show. Yes, it was. And until next time. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. Convergence.